two announcements I forgot. All right, uh, our text that was read by uh, Randy was Matthew 16, where it says, The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Uh, I want to talk to you this morning about the subject as, uh, so why the church? Uh, why the church? And uh, last week was Easter Sunday, and more people attend church across the nation, traditionally on Easter and Christmas. I believe that uh, we celebrate the resurrection every Sunday, and uh, so we ought to be faithful to church every Sunday, um, not just uh, Easter Sunday. But uh, I like, uh, I think it was Brian McDonald, when he shared the Seder, or when he spoke at the church, he shared a thought. I thought it was quite interesting. He said that uh, we are saved by grace, not of works. And what's interesting is that we as Christians celebrate a Sunday as a day of worship and rest, whereas the Jews celebrate Saturday, and there are some Christians. But what's interesting about everybody that celebrates Saturday as their Sabbath, uh, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant Sabbath, we celebrate the New Covenant what we call the Christian Sabbath, is that they work towards their Sabbath. They work, and the Sabbath, that day, is a picture of salvation. So it's interesting, they work towards their salvation. We start by grace in a day of rest, and then we work for to please the Lord. Amen. I thought that was quite interesting. I thought it was a good, good illustration of the difference of the two covenants. And the reason we worship on Sunday is that the resurrection is the basis of our salvation. And uh, so we, uh, Jesus did all the work. Jesus finished all the work. And then what we do the rest of the week and we work is to please him. And so, but uh, so many people that worship on the Saturday, Sabbath, you talk about Seventh Day of Venice, all these guys, they're really a works-based religion. So they try to work for their Sabbath. They work towards their Sabbath. And we start with rest in Jesus Christ. So I thought that was quite interesting. Good, good illustration that Brian gave. And I thought it was a really good illustration. Um, as we enter the end times, we will notice a great falling away of many people in obeying the command in Hebrews 10, 25, to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together is the manner of some. Many Christians are becoming neglectful in their heart for the passion to assemble themselves and obey this command. Through the years, I've invited people to church, and I've actually had people respond and say, well, you understand, uh, Reverend, I don't need that. I don't need church. I'm too busy, too busy for church. Others, maybe are not so bold, but in their actions, they say the same thing. When it comes to the work of the Lord in perilous times, some in response to the attitude of the day have decided to aggressively make church more relevant for the modern day world through a new music, new methods, new philosophies of ministry. These are what we call the contemporary Christians. They'll have all everything new and new Bibles, new this, new that. Uh, the Bible describes this trend in 2 Timothy 4, and it says that this is going to happen. It says, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned to fables. Now, let me just say that more and more uh, people are heaping to themselves uh, teachers after their own lusts. I thought that was an interesting statement. 
teachers after their own lusts. In other words, that appease their carnal nature. So there'll be more carnality in God's church, less emphasis on spirituality. And they will, it says they will heap things up. In other words, this will be the trend. It will not be done in a corner. It will not be a few here or there. But overwhelmingly, this will be the mass wave of the last days. And uh, you will see that more and more and as we enter the end times. And it says they will not endure sound preaching. And what is sound preaching? Sound preaching is that which reproves, rebukes, exhorts. You know, I remember years ago when I first came to the church and I'd be preaching away and uh, getting carried away and uh, somebody come up to me and say, Preacher, I appreciate that. That stepped on my toes. That's really stepped on my toes. In other words, people wanted to be provoked. People wanted to be challenged. Uh, Less and less do we see that. Less and less do we see that. Uh, People want to be agreed with. They want to hear preaching that agrees with them and doesn't rile them up or stir them up. There's more and more entertainment rather than sound doctrine and teaching. So welcome to the perilous times that will come in church ministry. Now, in light of that, I want to answer the question, so why the church? So why the church? First of all, to understand why we need a church or why the church, we got to understand what the church is. All right, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 30. We'll be turning to some verses. This is more of a topical message. I, Sunday school, I preach through the Bible. We go verse by verse. But uh, this morning I want to talk to you about this topic of the church. <clears throat> so why the church? Ephesians 5 and verse 30, page 1549 in your pew Bible if you need that. 1515, um, actually 1550, 530. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. The church... When you're part of the church, you are part of the members of Christ. You're his body, your flesh. And when Paul was persecuting the church in in, in the book of Acts, when the Lord appeared to him, he said, Paul, Paul, Saul, Saul, that was his name before he got saved. Why persecutest thou me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you persecute. In other words, when you, what you do to the church, you do to Christ, because The church is the bride of Christ. And the Bible says the two shall become one. So we are of his members. We're of his flesh. We're of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall join unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. And then Paul says an interesting thing. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So what is true of a marriage is true of the church. The church is married to Christ. The church is one body with Jesus. We are his members. We are his body made up of many different people. We are making a body called the church. Uh, The church is called the bride of Christ. So what is the church? The church is the bride of Christ. It's a living spiritual body of believers. It's not a club. It's not an organization. It's a body. It's alive. Mysteriously united together by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We are bonded together in spirit by the word of God to do the will of God on earth. All our outward ordinances and activities should be an outward manifestation of the mysterious invisible union between us and our Lord Jesus Christ. If we have ordinances, they are but outward pictures of a spiritual reality. When we get baptized, 
It pictures our invisible relationship to Jesus Christ. We're placed in his death. We're buried like, buried in his death, raised in his resurrection. Our family relationships, our marriages, our homes, our families, our picture of the church. The husband's the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. The bride or the woman or the wife is to be obedient to Christ. So therefore she should be obedient to her husband. The children ought to obey their parents. In other words, all of that is a spiritual picture of the church. And even our earthly relationships should manifest our spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible says, uh, obey your masters as unto the Lord. The Bible says that we ought to be... uh, We ought not to speak evil of dignities. We ought to pray for those that have the rule over. All these relationships should be manifestations of the true spiritual relationship we have with Jesus Christ. You do not become part of the church through outward ceremonies or traditions. You are born again into this body. Just as you are born into a family, physical You are born into the spiritual family through the Spirit of God. Just as you're born of Adam in the flesh, you're born of Jesus Christ in the Spirit. You are born into the church. You're not born physically into the church. The church doesn't grow by, uh, by biological growth. The church grows through spiritual growth. People need to be born, just because you're born of children, your children are born uh, and you're a member of this church, don't mean they're going to be members of the church unless they get born again. They have to be born again to become members. Now, we rejoice when children come to Sunday school. We rejoice when they come to Bible school and all this. But unless they get saved, they're not going to be part, they're not going to be part of the church. You just thought, you know, the covenant field, there's a reformed theology which teaches that if your parents uh, are Christians, they can christen you and you become a Christian. Now, we're a Baptist. We don't believe that. You, You have to come to an age of accountability where you of your own volitional will. Now, the Bible says, raise up the children according to the nurture of the Lord. If you raise your children in the word of God, you expose them to scripture, you bring them to church, you bring them to Sunday school, they, chances are that they will be saved. Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? So if you let them hear the word of God, they're going to be saved, probably, right? But there's no guarantee. I mean, uh, and the, the worse this world gets, the harder it becomes to see young people saved because they're being bombarded by humanism in public school. They're being bombarded in colleges. They're being bombarded quick, constantly bombarded by the world's philosophies. But we're born again, not of biological growth. We are not grow. We don't grow by biological growth in a church. We grow by spiritual growth, by being born again. Church is the assembly of a group of people that have been saved baptize, and endeavor to serve Jesus Christ and be a witness for him in this world. The church is the earthly assembly of God's heavenly people. It is the earthly manifestation of the people of God. Now, how do I become part of the church? Uh, Well, let's look at Matthew chapter 25. In Matthew 25... It talks about people that are in the church, but not part of the church. It talks about people that are on the church roll, but they're really not part of the church. How do you become part of that spiritual body? Matthew chapter 25, we read about a parable that Jesus gave about the bride of Christ called virgins. These are the bride of Christ. And again, the church is made up of many members, but we being many are one. 
And he says here in Matthew 25, verse 1, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Well, if you're here on earth, we're on a journey to meet the bridegroom. We are the virgins. We are the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ is made up of many different individual believers. So we're on a journey to meet our Savior, here, there, or up in the air. Some of us will meet him at death. Others will, there will be a small remnant of people who are alive when Jesus comes down and he will take us out of this world, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, at the last trump. He'll, the trumpet of God will sound, the dead shall rise. Now we're on our way. And it says, five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. And they that were foolish took their lamps, but they took no, no oil in them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. And while the bridegroom tarried, and folks today, the bridegroom is tarrying. The reason we're here and not there is because he's tarrying. He said, occupy till I come. So we're just occupying, waiting, waiting for when he comes. Now he says he may come at day, he may come at noon, he may come at midnight. But there are more verses that talk about him coming at midnight than any other time. He says, you know not the, the day or the hour or the time when he'll come. And it says here, when the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And that's about the way it is today. We have a sleepy church. We're exhausted. We've had 2,000 years of church history. You know, church has gone through a lot. We're coming through the end times, and it just seems like the whole church is asleep, spiritually. We talk about revival. We want revival. Well, revival means wake up. We want the church to wake up. But apparently the Lord's saying that when he comes, the church will be asleep. Huh? Notice this. And at midnight there was a cry made, and behold, the bridegroom cometh, and uh, the, the call was, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. It was dark out. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us. And ye, go rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And when they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterwards came the other virgin, saying, Lord, open to us. And he answered and said, Really, I say unto you, I know you not. Watch, therefore, for you know not neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Now, this is a parable, and a parable is a story that uh, is kind of an object lesson or tries to tell a truth. And here's the points of the truth. Number one, Jesus has gone away. Number two, he's left his church here to tarry. And number three, he's coming back. But only those that have this thing called the oil in their lamps are going to go. Oil is always a symbol in Scripture of the Holy Spirit. Oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Now, notice all ten of these virgins looked alike. From outward appearances, you cannot tell if someone is part of the true church. You, you could have an inkling. You could maybe think you know. You don't become part of the church just because your name is on church rolls. You don't become part of the church just because you've been baptized. You don't become part of the church, true church, just because you attend services. You don't become part of the true church just because you know doctrine. The only way you will be accepted as the bridegroom of the bridegroom as the bride is if you have oil in your lamp. Oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit of God. 
All ten virgins look alike outwardly. Now, let me say to you that the ten virgins represent everyone who claims to be a Christian. Not just the Elkdale Baptist Church. Broaden the umbrella. Everyone, everywhere that claims to be a Christian. Now, if this parable has any truth, only about a half of the professing Christians have oil in their lamp. In other words, only half of them are going to be taken. And that's quite a statement. Not part of the church. You're not just part of church because you're a Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian. All those who teach that Jesus was born of a virgin, died, buried, rose again according to scriptures, believe in the doctrine which defines you as a Christian. Only half of them are possessors of salvation according to this passage. Now let's look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 9. Romans chapter 8 and verse 9. In Romans chapter 8, verse 9, page 1491, if you need that in your pew Bible. It says in Romans 8 and verse 9, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, What does it say here, folks? Read it out loud. He is none of his. And so the Lord says to those five virgins who have no oil in their lamp, when they come back, he says, I never knew you. I don't know who you are. They're none of his. They were none of his. And therefore he proclaims that they are not his. You're you're not mine. You are not part of my church. You are not my church. The ones who did not have oil in their lamps, they're not part of the church. The Spirit of Christ is the oil. If this parable is, has a true application in real life, then Easter Sunday, many people got religious, but only half of the people that went to church on Easter Sunday are indeed part of his church. From outward appearances, all ten of these virgins look alike. Now, principle number two concerning being part of the church, only those virgins with oil in their lamps will qualify as the bride of Christ. For if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Why do some have it and others do not? Why do some have the spirit and others do not? The reason is simple, and it's shared in this parable. The five foolish virgins were not willing to be spent for the oil because the five wise said, go and buy for yourself. When the time came, Jesus returned for his bride, and the five foolish virgins were told to buy the oil for themselves. You cannot stand in place for anybody in that day. Salvation is not something you can give somebody. The Spirit of God is not something you could just hand over to somebody. The Spirit of God uh, is, look at, even Paul said, I could wish myself accursed for my brethren. You cannot substitute your salvation for somebody else's salvation. A mother cannot stand before the throne of God and says, Lord, don't let me in. Give myself, let my children take my place. Uh Uh-uh. We shall all stand alone. And that's, you know, that's very important. If you're raising children, you want your children to be able to stand alone in their salvation and to be saved. Just because they're in your home, and you attend church, and you're a Christian, doesn't mean they will be. 
unless they get the oil in their lamps. And you get the oil in your lamps, it's going to cost you something. You have to go out and buy the oil. You have to be spent for the oil. That's what he said. He said, I thought salvation is free. Yeah, it is. But it's an illustration of there's a reason why they didn't have the oil. And the reason why is that they didn't want to commit that area of their life that was necessary to commit in order to obtain that spiritual uh, commodity. They're all sleepy virgins. My, you know, the parable of sleepy virgins, five of them had no oil and they were told, go out and buy it. Now, when you buy something, you trade this that you value for this which you value more. And look at, there are, you know, Jesus said concerning salvation, he said, count the cost. Count the cost. And that cost is a commitment. And <clears throat> there are a lot of people that have shallow commitments when it comes to their salvation. And they, the Bible says that uh, they're like those foolish virgins who have no oil in their lamp. <clears throat> I can only tell you about my personal life and my, one of the things that held me back from getting saved, I heard the gospel, I understood the gospel, I mean, I understood it intellectually. It was shared very clearly with me. But <clears throat> as I counted the cost, I didn't want to commit to the gospel because I was afraid of my relationships with people, my parents, my family, who were, none of them were saved. And my career and different friends that I had, I realized that it is quite possible and probable that if I received Jesus Christ as my Savior, I would be alienated from them. And you know, Jesus said, if any man love father or mother, or houses, homes, or any, even his very life more than me, he cannot be my disciple. I mean, he said that. Now, what does that mean? So a preacher, I thought salvation is free. It is. He paid for it. But there's something about committing your life to Jesus Christ that alienates other people from you because you have the stench of the Holy Spirit and it's just like an animal. Birds of a feather flock together and when you receive the Holy Ghost, you become a different creature in Jesus Christ and people will see that. And unsaved people may not like it. And there are a lot of people don't want to be disliked. Now, I'd rather be disliked by people than be disliked by my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it took that. It took me to understand that. <clears throat> oh, Jesus said, I'd rather be hot. You have hot or cold, not lukewarm. There's a lot of lukewarm Christians who look like Christians, but they got no oil in their lamp. They're devoid of the Spirit of God. That's something you... I'm telling you, you can't see it outwardly. Now, sometimes you could suspect it. Sometimes but you don't know. The, even the angels get kind of confused. And, you, know, you know that? The Lord said about the wheat and the tares, let them alone, lest you disrupt the wheat. I believed in God. I prayed, but I had no oil in my lamp. Because I was not willing to empty my purse spiritual, and trade for that which is important, life in Jesus Christ. In Matthew 25, verse 8, the foolish said to the wise, give us of your oil. And it's not something you could trade. It's not something, you, the Holy Spirit is not something you could share. It's not something you could just give away. But the best thing you could do is show the value of the Holy Spirit, and that would give somebody a thirst to want it, and then they themselves could obtain it. But it's not something you could just hand over to somebody. 
At death, it'll be too late. At the coming of Christ, it'll be too late. <clears throat> Jesus said, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. Don't be like Lot's wife. Don't be like Judas Iscariot. He was among the 12, but he was not one of the 12. Don't be like that rebellious Israelite whose heart was stricken back to Egypt. What kept, these, kept back these five foolish virgins from purchasing, purchasing that oil? <clears throat> Maybe they thought they had time. They thought they could straddle the fence of neutrality. They thought they could wait to the last minute. They thought that the return of the bridegroom was afar off. Do you know this thing about Jesus saying, I'm coming soon? He's been saying that for 2,000 years. And you get to the point, like people get to the point, say, oh, well, we got plenty of time. We got more time now. Here, we are at the end time, and we're saying we got plenty of time. <laughs> if anybody should realize he's at the door, it should be us. But there's something about it where we don't, you know, There's something about us that don't, we don't have that concept of the reality that, you know, we're at the door. I've talked to a lot of people that are about to die, and none of them really know they're going to die. In their heart, they don't really, it, it's just something about us, we don't real. even if we knew it, even if we knew we were terminal, we wouldn't know it. There's something about us that our minds don't work. You know, we have to pull ourselves up by our spiritual bootstraps and say, look at Jesus could come at any minute. Let's get ready. Now, only as you give him the purse of your heart can you purchase the Holy Spirit. He don't want money. That purse is your heart. The purse of what you value in your heart is what you spend. You know, when, you know, when do two, two people get married? Only when they vow to forsake all others can they be married. You know, you do not buy a bride with money. You purchase the bride with your heart. Would you marry someone who wanted to still date after marriage? There are people that do that today. They, you know, this is a wacky world, isn't it? But you, when you come down that aisle, you say, I'm willing to forsake all others to be united with you, right? That's the way it works. Have you come to the place in your life where you have been willing to forsake all others? In other words, Jesus comes first. It will cost you something to do that. It will cost you in the area of commitment. It'll cost you in the area of dedication. You know, my wife and I, we dated for about six months before we got married. You don't know somebody in just six months, you know? But you know what? I knew enough. I knew enough. I knew enough that I said, I'm willing to commit. Amen? She didn't know a whole lot about me in six months, but she knew enough that she's willing to commit. And your marriage with Jesus Christ is a commitment. It's a step of faith. Now, all right, we're talking about the church. So why the church? All right, so first of all, we said how you get in a church, how you become part of the church. Now, why then do we need a physical group of people called the church? If all this is spiritual, it's invisible, you can't see it, it's just something between you and God. If the real church is an invisible, invisible mystical body and you could only become part of that by receiving the Holy Spirit of God and giving your heart and life to Him. Once you receive the Spirit of God, you become part of the church. Now, my question is why? So why, 
why do you need a physical body called the church or a group of people? Why, uh, until we're united to Christ, uh, you notice the ten virgins were huddled together in one place. Why were they huddled together in one place? Folks, that's the church. Why wasn't there one here, one there, one there, one there? Why were they all together? Because that's the definition of church. The word church means assembly. Why do we need a physical body that we call the church? Well, because it on earth represents the invisible body of Christ that cannot be seen, and God wants something on earth for people to see. The church is the outward manifestation, just like everything in, in, in the spirit world, everything in the spirit world cannot be seen, but God desires spiritual people to portray it in the physical world. Just as the marriage portrays the church, just as the family portrays the church, just as you know, all these things are outward, just like you get baptized. You get baptized, you, it, it's a picture. It's a spiritual picture. It represents what you are and what you believe. Communion is a spiritual picture. These are all spiritual pictures. These are very important to God. And therefore, the church is a spiritual picture. While we're waiting to enter the spiritual marriage, we have received orders from the Lord to stay together until he comes. The church is that place where we spiritually unite and stay together. Uh, and everything else is a reflection of that. Ephesians 5, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. It says, uh, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves, to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost had made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he purchased with his blood. Now, do you realize what those two verses say? These verses say that Jesus Christ died on the cross to purchase to himself a church. Now, we always stress the individual. Like we say, you know, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes on him should not. You know, we always say, now you put your name right there. God loved you. God loved you. But you know that word you is plural? God had in his mind a group of people. Now he knows the individuals. But his emphasis was the group. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church, not the saints, not the individuals. There is no promise that he'll keep you singular if you are not in good relationship with the group. Why were those ten virgins all grouped together? Because they represent the church. The church. Notice the Bible says Jesus had in mind drawing a group of people together called his church. He said to Peter, upon this statement, I will build my church that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Flesh and blood hath not revealed it to you, Peter, but my father which is in heaven. And upon that statement, I will build the church. For all those who make a similar statement and come to me will be part of that body. When Saul was persecuting the church, Jesus said, why persecutest thou me? All right, another parable in Luke chapter 19. All right, let's look at Luke chapter 19. Why the church? Luke chapter 19. The church is the physical manifestation of a spiritual group of people that have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That is why the church. 
Now I realize the church is made of many churches, but you can't belong to many churches. You belong to one church. Why? Because that's the way God ordained it, because we are not infinite, only God is. Luke chapter 19 and verse 12, page 1379, if you need that, 1379, 1912. He said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom in return. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus left. Jesus went to heaven. He's, he's going to return. All right. What does he do? And he called his ten servants. Notice the number ten again. Representing all his servants. He called his servants and delivered them ten pounds and said, occupy till I come. Now, where are you, the nobleman went into a far country, gave his servants 10 pounds, that he divided his property amongst his servants. And the nobleman had a vineyard. He had property, he had a house. He said, take care of these things till I come. Those who abandon the church are not being good stewards of their pound. What does he want you to invest that pound in? Your house? Your business? Sports? I submit to you, he wants you to invest that pound in his vineyard, his house, the church. This is what's important to him. And do you remember the one unjust steward, the one who laid that pound in a napkin? Huh? What happened? Hey. Hey, what's going on up there? How come this is not working? I just have to yell at all of you. <laughs> what's going on? Check the, check the speakers down there. See if there's power to those amplifiers, all right? I don't know what happened. All right, this is going to be bad. Is, uh, is it working up there as far as uh, huddle? There we go. There we go. Did you kick those things? You kicked them with your foot. I'm going to call you Bigfoot. <laughs> you don't, don't pay much, don't expect much. <laughs> All right. But anyway, you know, you think about this, that the that Lord had a vineyard. He had a farm. He had, he, our Lord is using illustrations to help people to understand uh, you know, spiritual truth. So he gives them physical pictures to understand spiritual truth. Now, he, those who abandoned the church are not even in the right place to receive reward for the Lord. Those who abandon the local church are not huddled together to be there when the bridegroom comes. Those who abandon the local church are not going to be able to invest in the kingdom of God. You see, I was talking, many years ago, I was talking to Brother Abonte, Pastor Abonte, were any of you here when Bonte came through? If you, you know who Bonte is? Bonte has a large church in the Philippines. I think his church runs about 1,000. He is also a, um, a representative in, in Manila. He has a very high office. And uh, so he came through. He's, he's, got, uh, he's the head of the BBF in, in uh, Philippines. And I was telling I was only here a few years, and I was telling him about a few folks in the church got mad at me. 
And they got upset about some things and we're having a building project. They didn't think we were able to have a building project because we didn't have any money. You know, you don't have to have money to have a building project. All you got to have is the Lord. Amen. The Lord owns the cattle on a thousand hills. So I, I said that uh, this, this family got mad at me and they kind of left the church, and got upset and bad mouthed me. And I said they got sick, and both of them died, the husband and the wife, they both died. And uh, so I'm talking about it, and Brother Bonte, without hesitation, you know what he said to me? He looked at me right straight in the eye, he said, Brother Bissell, they're in hell. I went, what? You know, I never think of people who break fellowship with a church as not being saved. I, I, we just don't think that way in the States. But he did. He does. In his mind, you break relationship with the church, you break relationship with Christ. Now, I don't know where I... I'm just telling you what he said. I haven't really studied it out, but, but he is a very, very strong local church. But I will say this. Turn with me to 1 John 4 and verse 20. What is the purpose of the church? You know what the purpose of the church is? For a group of people who are saved to physically manifest, manifest on planet earth, a group of people who are saved manifest that they are children of God, right? Amen. So this group of people get together. They say, we are the children of God. And what makes a person a child of God, 1 John 4 and verse 20, it says right here, in page 1622, if you need that in your Bibles. But if any man say, I love God, if any man say, I'm saved, if any man say they're part of the church, you there? I don't think I'm stretching it. Man say, I love God. And what? Hateth his brother. He is what? He is a liar. He is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Now that one fella who got upset at me because we're going to have a church. We're going to have a church building. Uh, we're going to do a building a project. We had no money in the bank. We had absolute. We had no money. We didn't have any money. I said God's going to lead us, and God's going to give us what we need to have this building project. He got so upset at me. I mean, he said, "How could I preach? Or how could he have a building project without any money?" Because I got a God. Amen. And I believe he was leading us in that direction. Well, anyway, he got sick. I went to visit him in the hospital. I walked into his room. I said, brother, I've come to pray with you. And when I walked into his room, he turned and faced the wall and would not even acknowledge me. Now, what does this say here? If any man say, I love God and hate his brother, he's what? A liar. A liar. And he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? In other words, this is why Abonte said, brother, he's in hell. We don't like to say that of anybody, do we? I'm like you, you're like me, we don't, right? We feel funny saying that. But Abonte didn't. And I'm just telling you what he said. But he's got scripture to back up what he said. Look at You don't like being around God's birds of a feather flock together. Amen? Amen. Birds of a feather flock together. You ever notice out there that they all, all the birds that are similar, they all flock together? My wife, she puts out this bird feeder. And these birds come out there, and I always notice there's always two dove, and they're always coming together, the two dove. And then there's, 
this little rat that comes. They call it, they call it a chipmunk. I call it a rat. A chipmunk comes and chases everything else away because it wants all the seed. You know, so there she is causing a division between the animal kingdom with all these seeds that mess up my porch. And I got to go out there and sweep them, you know. But birds of a feather flock together. The church is God's bride. The church is God's vineyard. The talents given to his servants were to be invested in the master's vineyard. The church is God's house. We as his servants are supposed to be part of that building. You know, we are to be adding to that building till he comes. All right, one more. I guess we're going to have to pick this up tonight because I'll never get through all this. I'll try to bring it to a conclusion. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 10. What's the purpose of the church? The purpose of the church is to do the work of God on earth. We are to occupy. We are to be busy. We're to be building his church. We're to be working his vineyard. We're to be investing in the kingdom of God. Look at 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 10. Paul is talking about page 1505, if you need that in your pew Bible. Uh, chapter 3 and verse 10 says this. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder. Now, Paul as a, an apostle, calls himself a builder. And I have laid the foundation, another build it thereon, but let every man take heed how he build it thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon the foundation, what's the foundation? Salvation in Jesus Christ. And what are we building? The church. The church. God's building. God's house. God's bride, we're adding to it gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive reward. Now look it, you are not going to be rewarded in heaven for anything you do outside of the church. This is his building. This is his vineyard. This is his house. This is what he gave his servants the talents for. Be occupied. Look at not everything you do, you must do for the kingdom of God and everything he said, I will build my football stadium. I will build my mall. What did he say I'll build? Church. 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 If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved by fire. A lot of things people think they're doing good works and doing this and doing that. And then it's not amounting to a hill of beans for the church. It's going to burn up. Now they could be saved. They could be sincere. They could be sincerely wrong. Know ye not that you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwelleth in you? All right, now, look at the church. The church. The church. He's tearing. We need to be about his church. So what are the practical reasons I need a local church? I'm just going to give them to you. I can't explain them. I want to give them to you because some of you backslidden people are not going to come back, I know. Uh, number one, for the protection against the gates of hell. You read in the book of Revelation when the church is gone. We believe the church will be gone in, in, in Revelation after chapter 3. The church, come up hither. That's the rapture, what we call the rapture, the resurrection. First resurrection. Then it says Satan will prevail against the saints. But Jesus, there's no contradiction in the Bible. Jesus said Satan will not prevail against the church. But he will prevail against the saints. You individually without a church are mincemeat for the devil. You need, your family's mincemeat. You're mincemeat. 
uh, to fulfill the Great Commission. He gave that to the church. To strengthen each other, to do the work of the Lord. He gave that to the church. The church is a place to discover your spiritual gifts. The church is a place to practice kingdom business. And uh, there's a lot of verses about that. I, I can't get into it. Church is a place to uphold the truth. The church is a place to uh, where you give your... What, in the Old Testament, they brought offerings to God. Where do you bring the offerings in the New Testament? My Bible says the church, the church, the house of God. The church is a place where you find godly leadership and direction, Ephesians 4. Church is a place where other preachers can be sent out. I, I had a preacher friend just say to me, some missionary called him, and I know the missionary. And he said he called him and said he'd like, him to come, he'd like to come present his work. He said, what church are you out of? And this guy didn't have a church. He decided he was going to start his own church, and it fizzled out. Didn't have a church. Just he and his family. And that preacher rightly said to him, if you don't have a church, who's sending you? You know who's sending him? So send I, I. So send I, me. No, the church is the sending agent, right? That's what we're supposed to do, send out missionaries. Send out different preachers. The church is a place where other preachers can be sent. We should strengthen the local church. Um, and bottom line, in the day that we live, God's program and desire is to work through the church to bring people to himself. Why the church? Simply put, it's God's program. It's what God wants. I have committed my life to church work ever since I got saved. Now, I should say ever since I got baptized, before I got baptized, I was kind of like a, a bit of a rebel in that area. I didn't think I needed a church. You know, I was a single guy, didn't have a family, and I was only saved a couple months. I came up here to Baptist Bible College to sit in on classes, and uh, Charlie Ware was there, and Charlie Ware said to me, Brother Bissell, what church do you belong to? And I said to Charlie Ware, I said, Charlie, you know, I'm a single guy. I don't have family. I'm not married. You know, I don't need a church. And he looked at me. He says, yeah, church is for the family of God. <laughs> he rebuked me real quick. And you know what? I needed that. I needed rebuke. And I appreciated that because I learned a lot from that one statement. If I'm in the family of God, I need a church, right? Yeah. Shortly after that, I got baptized and joined the church. Church is God's ordained institution to bring growth, spiritual blessings. Now, folks, this is not Pastor Bissell's church. This is Christ's church. Now, a lot of people turn around and uh, look to get the wrong ideas about the church. They think, just because Pastor Bissell does a lot here doesn't mean it's my church. Before, it was my, before I came here, they used to say this church was Selwyn Schmidt's church. You know why? Selwyn did everything around here. It wasn't his church. It's not my church. This is not your, and a lot of times people look at the church as a, as a mooching agent or something that just wants your money or just wants this or that or the other thing. Uh-uh. This is God's church. This is God's work. We're God's people. Amen? Amen? Let's get used to that. All right? The church is that ordained institute for God to give blessings spiritual to his people. Let's all stand. Lord, thank you now for your people that have come out to hear this message and maybe some are here just like when I was young in the Lord and I thought I didn't need a church. But uh, that preacher rebuked me and said, yeah, the church is, a church is for the family of God. And Lord, I hope everybody here realizes church is for the family of God. And I pray they're part of the family of God. And if not, I pray they would commit their hearts to you 
that they might be part of that family, that they might buy of you that oil. The purse is their heart. The oil is the Holy Spirit. And you said whoever commits their heart and life to you, you'll give them that Holy Spirit freely. And I pray now that you would apply this message to the hearers as only you can. I don't know, there's a probably a thousand different applications. Apply it to each individual as they need it. And bless the message to the hearers. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.